Hello. <coughs> good day, students. Uh, hope you are in good condition. Uh, this is our third topic, and it talks about uh, demand for sustainability. We have here uh, two words, demand and sustainability. Uh, when we talk about demand, uh, there is also supply, and sustainability is uh, continuous. No? Uh, let us first uh, talk about uh, demand, uh, which is talking about consumers. Uh, supply, we talk about manufacturers and producers. Uh, let's first tackle sustainability. Sustainability uh, is what we do today will benefit uh, future generations. And sustainability uh, has three pillars. One is environmental. Number two is uh, economic. Number three is social. So, uh, whenever a business uh, claims that uh, their corporate social responsibility is sustainable. It could be uh, assessed or appraised whether the corporate social responsibility is benefiting, benefiting the environment. Does it do, uh, does it give benefit uh, to the uh, social aspect? Uh, like, for example, the community, the stakeholders. Does the corporate social responsibility benefit uh, in terms of economy? Uh, yes, I do agree that some companies uh, use greenwashing just to promote their uh, so-called product that is coined as green just to uh, give them uh, profit and revenues. So, the topic about the demand for sustainability. Uh, what is really uh, the demand for sustainability? Uh, the demand for uh, sustainability uh, talks about uh, some internal and external pressures to the business that they should take more steps, add more extra effort, that their actions that they do today will really benefit the environment and future generations to come. Hey, this is uh, slide number 60. Why is there a pressing demand for sustainability? The excessive destruction of the natural environment resulted to social pressure. It is a global environmental situation that called the attention of many countries to collectively work in finding lasting solutions. Business processes are redesigned to ensure the sustainability requirement agreed by many countries. The three factors environmentalists often point to as responsible for environmental pollution. Number one is population. Number two, technology. And number three is consumption. Consumption seems to get the least attention. One reason, no doubt, is that it may be the most difficult to change. Our consumption patterns are so much part of our lives that to change them would require a massive cultural overhaul, not to mention severe economic dislocation. A drop in demand for products as economists note brings on economic recession or even depression along with massive unemployment.
demand for sustainability. Uh, according to uh, uh, Brutland Report 1987, what is this report all about? This is a, a report that came from the United Nations uh, wherein it was participated by uh, uh, develop, developed countries. No? They all agreed uh, and come up to call a consensus that they will uh, reduce uh, their discharge of their carbon emission, thus reducing uh, greenhouse gases. So this report also tackles the definition of sustainability and according to this report, uh, it is uh, a pattern of uh, how we use the resources and basically these resources aims to meet the human needs. Uh, but in this report, it emphasizes that there should be preservation of the environment. Uh, though uh, these needs uh, need to be met in the present, but if our actions in the present will jeopardize the environment, a good example is mining. If you use to get resources uh, for uh, mining, for uh, minerals, you use acid, strong acid, to process the raw materials, but you don't have a sewerage treatment plant. And the discharge or the affluent goes directly to river banks and body of water. Here, what is sacrificed is aquatic life and plants. And the water that the communities need to use in order for them to drink. So, in that aspect, there is no sustainability. That mining company has a false claim if they are doing a corporate social responsibility that they don't think about the environment, they don't think about the community, but all they think is the revenue and profit for their own good. And next vital thing, next important thing is sustainability uh, is really founded or is really grounded on the economic development, the social development, and environmental protection. So this is the measure uh, whether uh, a certain thing is sustainable or not. Uh, let's take for example uh, uh, a chicken uh, wherein you are a farmer and you raise chicken but these chicken are placed in, you know, and housed in uh, a house in uh, a certain cage or caged chicken, they are fed with, uh, you know, uh, they are fed with food that is chemically uh, mixed. Uh, and because of this, it has really an impact or effect on the lives and, you know, the the health of the chicken as compared to a uh, a free-range chicken. A free-range chicken really can help the farmer to be uh, to have a, a cost savings in terms of feeding the chicken uh, in terms of uh, there is no uh, chemically introduced in the, uh, for the food for the chicken. Uh, that's why if you compare the price of a caged chicken versus a free-range chicken, which is very organic, uh, it, it demands a premium price no, for free-range. So you talk about environmental protection not using some chemicals, especially uh, in their food. Uh, you talk about the social development. Uh, it does not 
uh, effect. Uh, it gives uh, an opportunity no, for the community to be engaged uh, if they want to grow uh, a free-range chicken. And on the economic aspect of the business, it gives the farmer an opportunity to reduce their cost no? because they don't need uh, in their resources to buy a lot of uh, chemically uh, intoxicated uh, food for the, uh, for the chicken. Uh, let's take also organic farming. No? Uh, in uh, organic farming, if you want to produce, uh, let's say, rice plantation, uh, you use fertilizers, which is very destructive to the environment once it is uh, mixed and it goes to river banks or body of water. Uh, in the economic development, uh, once you use organic fertilizers, which uh, in the same process uh, gives you uh, an opportunity to improve the social lives of the farmers. So these are examples of sustainability. Uh, that uh, You talk about uh, sustainability, it is measured uh, in the three pillars, environmental, you protect your environment, there is social and community development, and there is also economic development. The next vital thing is the, uh, uh, the result of uh, demand for sustainability, the result of increasing global concern for the state of the environment. Uh, government control parameters intended to intervene with business actions that have impact over the environment improving society's awareness and markets environmentalism. So um, here, uh, yes, I, I do believe that uh, uh, globally a lot of countries are uh, focusing on their uh, carbon footprint emission uh, and uh, a lot of companies uh, and countries uh, like those who are members of the uh, Kyoto Protocol and those uh, who sign, countries who sign uh, in the Rio Declaration, uh, actually the uh, Rio Declaration, uh, they, of course, they met the, these uh, countries who participated uh, last 1992, June 3rd to the 14th at Rio de Janeiro, uh, they reaffirmed the uh, declaration of the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment that was adopted at Stockholm on June 16, 1972. And this is their foundations. Uh, their goal uh, is to establish a new and equitable global partnership. How? By the creation of uh, a new and intensified levels of cooperation among countries uh, with the, that will benefit the society and the people. They work hard towards international agreements uh, that respect the interests of all ma the majority and the protection of the global environment and the developmental system. Um, in the uh, Rio Port Protocol, they were able to establish uh, 27, rather 20, 27 principles uh, of all these uh, countries who participated. And uh, in uh, and the next one was in uh, Kyoto was the Kyoto Protocol, uh, wherein uh, the Kyoto Protocol is basically participated also by the uh, this was. Uh, adopted uh, on December 11, 1997, uh, owing to a complex ratification process. Uh, 
uh, it entered into force on February 16, 2005. There are 192 parties uh, to the Kyoto Protocol. In short, the Kyoto Protocol uh, is operationalized by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. No? Uh, by committing uh, to industrialized countries to limit and reduce greenhouse gases emissions in accordance with agreed individual targets. Meaning to say, each of the participating countries have set up their objectives and they have a target for their uh, uh, reduction of their greenhouse gases. The Kyoto Protocol is based on the principles and provisions of the Convention and follows its annex-based structure. It also binds developed countries and places a heavier burden on them under the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. Why? Because it recognizes that they are largely responsible for the current high levels of greenhouse gases emission in the atmosphere. So, there you go. We have the Brundtland Report, we have the Rio Declaration, and we have the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, these are... Uh, interrelated with each other primarily the purpose is to reduce greenhouse gases to save the environment so uh, companies nowadays uh, they are pursuing uh, a corporate social responsibility or corporate shared value uh, and of course my dear students you can only uh, guarantee and warranty that a product is green if the supply chain from input to process are all uh, made up of indigenous materials not toxic materials uh, processes that uh, reduce uh, your kilowatt hour consumption processes that uh, will have great impact uh, not to jeopardize and distract our environment but rather help communities to be involved that I assure you is a genuine green product We have to acknowledge that businesses are part of a wider community and so we have to comply with the agreed environmental measures to protect our natural resources. In so doing, let us understand the basis for the environmental attitude of our consumers. The uh, environmental attitude of the consumers depends on the importance of the environmental issue they are facing. Importance refers to the consumer's view of environmental behavior as compatible to self-interest or the society. Another basis for the environmental attitude is inconvenience or the perceived inconvenience by the individual when behaving in an ecologically acceptable manner. Example, one of the many initiatives of Unilever in ensuring sustainability in the products they market is to use sachet packs in big volumes, approximately 150 ml, for the packaging of their Vaseline and sun silk shampoo. When the company aggressively marketed the new packaging, they tape a refillable pump bottle 
The idea is to encourage the buying of sachet packs and refill the bottle when needed instead of buying a bottle of shampoo only to end up as garbage after the product is used up. Unilever knew that by doing this, they are able to reduce plastic waste, while the sachet packs are recovered by the company and transformed into brown boxes and hollow blocks used in their Gawad Kalinga projects. The consumers understood the importance of modifying the packaging but somehow they found it inconvenient to refill the bottle. This is how we should understand consuming buying behavior for green products. It is not sufficient to just educate consumers just so they will understand the importance of changes in the product they buy. We must also consider the inconvenience of the change we are asking them to do. Aside from the basis for environmental attitude, we also need to learn the variables influencing the attitude. The first variable is eco-literacy or educated consumers, refers to the knowledge of the consumers on the production process that enables them to distinguish products that comply with the environmental standard on developing producing, packaging, and distributing green products. These are consumers who make rational choices when purchasing. The use of marketing communication is very important when dealing with educated consumers. The second variable is considering the consumers whose buying decisions are influenced by their social relationships. Interpersonal influence is a variable supported by the social cognitive theory, which says that social influences and physical structures within the environment develop and modify human expectations, belief, and cognitive competences. Reference groups and social institutions influence individuals' attitude toward the state of the environment. The third variable influencing the environmental attitude is something innate in the person, his or her value orientation. Value orientation is the belief that a specific end state of existence or specific mode of conduct is preferred to an opposite end state or mode of conduct for living one's life. The value that we give to the natural environment or the lack of it is shaped by our value orientation. The level of importance and inconvenience that we give to the pressing needs of the environment are largely reliant on the manner our value systems are formed during our lifetime. So, educated consumers uh, can be equated to eco-literacy. Uh, again, as mentioned, this is the knowledge of consumers on the uh, different uh, production processes for a particular product on how the product is transformed to an output. Uh, and this, uh, and this uh, knowledge of consumers uh, complies. Uh, they know that the, they are aware that the product is compliant with the environmental standard with regards to developing, producing, packaging, and distributing green products. So, uh, these are the learned consumers. Consumers make use of uh, rational choices. No? Uh, before they make a choice, they have to have uh, a value-based judgment. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, variables influencing attitude. When we say interpersonal influence, there is the social uh, intervention no? uh, or uh, the social cognitive theory applies and 
it states that social influences and physical structures within the environment that develop and modify human expectations, belief, and cognitive competences. So, social influence and physical structure can influence our interpersonal uh, attitudes. Uh, reference groups and social institutions uh, influence individuals' attitude toward the state of the environment. Uh, this next uh, variables is uh, value orientation. Uh, belief that a specified end state of existence or specific mode of conduct is preferred to an opposite end state or mode of conduct for living one's life. So, uh, the value that we give to the natural environment or the lack of it is shaped by our value orientation. So, it depends on uh, your value as a person is uh, can uh, influence your attitude. The level of importance and inconvenience that we give to the pressing needs of the environment are largely reliant on the manner our value systems are formed during our lifetime. Let us uh, see here a, uh, an XYZ uh, comparison of relationship. Uh, you have on the first column the influence variables and uh, comparing it to attitude and willingness to buy. You can see in the echo literacy uh, on the first row and attitude, it has a positive relationship which is called collectivist culture. Uh, if it's a negative relationship, it's called an individualistic culture. Uh, under the third row, interpersonal influence and relationship with attitude, it has a negative relationship followed by value orientation, which uh, showed a positive relationship. So, Attitude is, you know, uh, can be uh, uh, related to the willingness to buy, right? So, uh, what to do? Uh, as marketers, we can maximize marketing communications, particularly public relations when communicating and educating our stakeholders about what the firm is doing in relation to the environmental pressures and promoting the relevant product features. Public relation is also used to challenge, strengthen, and support policy formation by way of public involvement and lobbying. So, uh, here is our assessment exercise. Uh, but first of all, the, the raw material for this assessment is about the Rio Declaration, Kyoto Protocol, and the Brutland Report. Uh, you need this, uh, you must uh, read this first so that you can answer the question below. So, uh, the instruction is a narrative essay. Uh, of course, you don't have to print it in a in a band paper, you could just upload this in a PDF file in the school book. Single space, uh, times New Roman 12, and of course, uh, not to exceed the, a page, right? The first question here says that you discuss comprehensively the sustainability of the principles stated in the Rio Declaration. The second is you discuss comprehensively the environmental compliance of the Philippines with respect to the Kyoto Protocol and the Brundtland Report. You must cite three cases in the country. Uh, let me start first with the uh, uh, Kyoto or, or rather the Rio Declaration.
the Rio, uh, the two of the significant uh, global move to address the environmental issues are Rio Declaration and the Kyoto Protocol. Below, uh, you know, is there a, a brief introduction. Rio Declaration is the output of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development or the acronym UNCED, widely known as the Rio Earth Summit was held on June 3rd to 14, 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The Rio Summit focused on developing a global framework for addressing environmental degradation through sustainable development. The purpose of the summit is to have countries sign up and commit to participate in the sustainable development programs that will ultimately benefit the natural environment. Through the participation of both state and non-state actors, the main themes and agendas of the Rio Summit were condensed into several documents and institutional mechanisms. The documents provided guidance for communities worldwide who decide to integrate sustainable development goals into their governance structure. The main documents produced at the summit include number one, Agenda 21, number two, Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, Statement of Forest Principles, four, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, 5. United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Guys, you need to research this in the internet and do uh, a extra mile uh, to uh, learn the contents of this agenda. The second is the Kyoto Protocol. This is an international agreement linked to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which commits its parties by setting internationally binding emission reduction targets. It recognizes that developed countries are principally responsible for the current high levels of greenhouse gases emissions in the atmosphere as a result of more than 150 years of industrial activity. The protocol places a heavier burden on developed nations under the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. The Kyoto Protocol is adopted in Kyoto, Japan on 11 December 1997 and entered into force on 16 February 2005. The detailed rules for the implementation of the protocol were adopted at COP7 in Mar Marrakesh, Morocco in 2001 and are referred to as Marrakesh Accords. Its first commitment period started in 2008 and ended in 2012. During the seventh session of the Conference of the Parties or COP7 in October 2001, Kyoto Protocol agreed for the member countries to limit or reduce their greenhouse gases emissions by setting targets and trading emission. Emission reductions took on economic value. To help countries meet their emission targets and to encourage the private sector and developing countries to contribute to emission reduction efforts, negotiators of the protocol included three market-based mechanisms, emissions trading, the clean development mechanism or ZDM, and joint implementation or JI. Emissions trading as set out in Article 17 of the Kyoto Protocol allows countries 
that have emission units to spare emissions permitted them but not use to sell this excess capacity to countries that are over their targets. A new commodity was created in the form of emission reductions or removals since carbon dioxide is the principal greenhouse gas. People speak simply of trading in carbon. Carbon is now tracked and traded like any other commodity. This is known as the carbon market. Kyoto Protocol's Clean Development Mechanism CDM is allowing emission reduction projects in developing countries to earn certified emission reduction CER credits, each equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide. These CERs can be traded and sold and used by industrial countries to omit a part of their emission reduction targets under the Kyoto Protocol CDM is 1. A mechanism that stimulates sustainable development and emission reductions while giving industrialized countries some flexibility in how they meet their emission reduction limitation targets. And number 2. The main source of income for the UNFCCC Adaptation Fund which was established to finance adaptation projects and programs in developing country. Parties to the Kyoto Protocol that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. The adaptation fund is financed by a 2% levy on CERs issued by the CDM. The Philippines is a signatory on April 15. 1998 ratified and accepted on November 20, 2003 entered into force on February 16, 2005.